So he says to his men, your wife, your kids, we need to kick them out into no man's land where Caesar will take care of them. Well, he kicks them all out. Caesar does not take care of them. Mm. Caesar does not have enough food for his men inside the fortifications. So the two armies sat there for weeks while the women and children cried. A circle within a circle. Yes. While the women and children in the no man's land were exposed to the elements, they had no food. And the men, the, the Gallic men who were besieged, who had kicked out their own wives and kids, they watched their families die. Oh, God. Hey, welcome back to another WTF history. I, I went back and I looked at, it's actually a pretty popular episode that we did on John Tyler. And I'm so embarrassed because I kept saying John Tyler gave birth. John Tyler <laughs> gave birth. So I knew what you meant. Yeah, I hope I the audience what knew what I meant. I am not an idiot. But you know what? Also, I'm not here to shame John Tyler either. So who? how do we know? He Maybe he did. I am not going to judge. That but um, I want to clarify that. So, hey, how you doing, Mike, uh, today? What are we going to talk about, ancient stuff? We are talking about the foundation of two ancient empires, and this should be very fascinating. Actually, three, dude, because my empire is two. That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. Well, hey, so is mine. So is mine. Byzantines. Oh, Byzantines. all right. All right. Good point. Well, let's go. Why don't you kick it off? I'm anxious to hear. Okay, so we, we are going to talk about the most fascinating battle, I think, in the history of the Roman Empire. And it's one that happened right before the Roman Empire emerged. It is the Battle of Elysia that involves, you know, just tremendous, tremendous military uh, machinations by Caesar, one of the greatest generals of all time. The year is 52 BC, and Rome is still a republic. It's not an empire yet. And Caesar has passed out of public office, and he is now the governor of Gaul. People don't know this, but modern France, right, was then called Gaul. Um, the people who inhabited it at that time were akin or they were related and they spoke a language that was certainly Gaelic and Celtic, um, although there are people who debate if they are truly related. Um, and of course, the Romans had a lot of history with the Gauls. Um, in the very, very early times of the Roman Republic, Rome was sacked by a marauding tribe of Gauls who had marched down from modern France. And so the Romans feared them. To this day, many hundreds of years later, they really feared the Gauls. And this was a wild province. Uh, really funny. Uh, part of Gaul was a, uh, was a Roman province already. And they called it simply the province. And to this day, that part of France is called Provence, right? And part of, uh, part of northern France, they called Gallia Comata, which means long-haired Gaul, the place where, you know, you still got these dudes wearing hats and, you know, the, the horned hats and the long hair and so on and so forth. So Caesar gets to his office as governor of Gaul, and he starts pacifying the tribes. He wants them to trade with Rome and kind of calm down a little bit. And uh, there's one guy, this one king, and his king, the king's name is Wersen Gederex, okay? And he starts using this as a unification to, to gain his power. He's like, hey, you know, screw these Romans. We should unite as Gallic tribes. And he starts building his power. Worsen Gederix, his name means something akin to great king. Um, as an aside that I think a lot of you named Rick will be, maybe some of you named Eric will be fascinated to hear. Every single name that has Rick in it, Richard, Rick, whatever, means king. That's, that's, that's the ah, root of it. Right? Really? And so, yeah. And so in, in, you know, for those of you who read asterisk comment, uh, comics and stuff like that, you're used to seeing Rick's in Gaelic. Yeah. That means king. So Caesar is there and he's got 50,000 Italian legionnaires and Worsen Gederix has got about 80,000 Gauls and they fight a bunch of inconclusive battles, but they get in the situation where the Romans are basically chasing the Gallic force around. And finally, he holds up in a town called Elysia. Um, we don't know exactly where it is. We just know that it was a fortress, um, that it was impenetrable. It was up on a hill. It had a water source. It was a fortress. And Worsen Gederix holes up there. And Caesar says, look, I, I'm, I'm a good general. There's no way we're going to take this from a, from a, with a headlong assault. We're going to have to put it to the siege. So what he does is called a contravallation. He, uh, he starts to build a wall around this fortress so that nothing can get in or get out. Um, he puts his men to work building 10 miles of fortifications. Now, some of you are like, oh, okay, 10 miles. I mean, I want you to think about this. This is before there were power tools, right? They're going off to the forest in the morning. It's a long walk. 
they are chopping down trees with handheld axes. Um, they're carrying the trees one by one. And you know about how wide a tree is, right? They are surrounding this town with 10 miles of fortifications by hand, by hand, okay? And they're digging ditches, 14, 14 feet ditches to fill up with water and then building 14 foot high mounds of dirt on top of the things so that nobody can get in or out, right? He wants to starve them into submission. Uh, the Romans go to bed one night. Um, they built 23 towers. There's one tiny little bit that's still open. They go to bed one night. It's a foggy night. They hear hoof prints. They hear that and they pretty much, they, they capture a few of the, the folks. They learn really quickly that King Worsen Gedrex hold up, has sent uh, some riders out to the last little hole to get a relief army, to get the word out. So the Romans know that a relief army is coming. And by talking with the messengers and by getting it out of them somehow, uh, he learns that the, the message that the king had sent to them was, all of Gaul has to unite against the Romans. I want every tribe here within a couple of weeks. So Caesar, this is, this is sort of a moment that defines greatness. Does he leave? Does he go home? Does he say, gee, I'm going to be killed? He now builds a circumvallation a, around him. Okay. So he has one around them, uh, circum, right around them. And he builds another one around him. He traps himself in the middle, knowing that he's going to fight a two front war, but he feels that comfortable with his fortification. So he sends the, his exhausted guys out again, right? They got to go further now into woods that have not been cut down. And rather than 10 miles, they have to build 13 miles because it's a bigger circle. And again, you know, the width of a tree, right? Imagine the amount of trees he's got to cut down and bury by hand to build 13 miles, you know, 23 siege towers, all this crazy stuff, right? So in, in the city, Worsen Gedrex is rationing grain, right? Because he knows starvation is coming. He's not sure when the relief army will come. And this next chapter is something that should make everybody listening say WTF. So Worsen Gedrex at some point says, you know what? We're rationing guys to about a thousand calories a day. There's not enough grain for everybody here. He says, we're going to expel everyone from the city. We're going to expel the women and the children because we don't have enough food to, to take care of them. And he goes, and we're going to force Caesar to take care of them. Now you have to remember, this was friendly territory for the Gauls. A lot of the women and children that were expelled, these were the women and children of the guys mm. fighting. So he says to his men, your wife, your kids, we need to kick them out into no man's land where Caesar will take care of them. Well, he kicks them all out. Caesar does not take care of them. Mm. Caesar does not have enough food for his men inside the fortifications. So the two armies sat there for weeks while the women and children cried. A circle within a circle. Yes. While the women and children in the no man's land were exposed to the elements, they had no food. And the men, the, the Gallic men who were besieged, who had kicked out their own wives and kids. They watched their families die. Oh, God. Roughly a month later, right? Caesar wakes up one day and they look out, you know, to the wall that he's built around his forces. And he sees a 90,000 strong relief army has him surround. Well, you just answered my next question. Where was the relief <laughs> army? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Relief army comes. Worse than Gedrix, you know, blows the loudest horn he has to try to coordinate when they should both attack. And at the same time, the two forces attack. It is a three day battle. Right. Both sides are starving. Um, they fight all day, all night for three days straight. Caesar is fighting on both sides, right? Caesar is fighting. His men are fighting on both sides. There's roughly 50,000 guys, 25,000 facing one direction, fighting 80,000 men coming down from the city and 90,000 men coming from the, from the outside fortifications. Jesus. So he, he sees on the last day that his men are getting pushed back. There's a key place where the Gauls have broken through the fortifications and they're rushing in. So again, another, another moment that makes greatness, right? What does Caesar do? He does what he did in other battles. He puts on the brightest possible cape he has. You're going to talk about where he got the dye? Yes, yes you yes, are. Right. Yeah, he, mm -hmm. he takes off his helmet, which is protecting his head, and he rides straight into the fray. And he says, guys, I'm fighting right alongside you. And by the way, I'm going to die if you don't fight a little harder. <laughs> his guys fight as hard as, and by the way, he's about 50 something years old at this point, right? So he's no spring chicken. Yeah. His men are inspired. They push the relief army back. Um, 
the the relief army sounds the retreat. Caesar's men chase them down with their cavalry. Um, he wrote in his journal, he said, we would have, we captured 40,000 Gauls and we're going to sell them as slaves. We would have captured more, but we were too exhausted to keep pursuing them. So that's the relief army. Me meanwhile, Vercingetorix is faring no better in the inside circle. He realizes that the gig is up. Um, mm. He tells his men that he's going to surrender. He walks out one day and, you know, there's been dozens of paintings about this. You know, he lays down his sword. He's taken back. Uh, he's taken back to Rome to, uh, you know, to, to be marched in a parade. Um, and he's put in a prison. Mm. Um, and a few years later, he, is, uh, he gets a death penalty. He is killed by the Romans. Um, the prison where he was put to death is still there. Yeah. You can visit it in Rome. I visited on my honeymoon and I know a joke is coming, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but it's really, really fascinating. And the, the thing for you to realize what a tremendous battle this was too, I mean, besides those crazy statistics I told you that make you say WTF, is that the Roman Senate, this is a republic just like our country today, the Roman Senate votes for a 20-day holiday. 20 days. Yeah, victory. They just want people to, to mm -hmm. just stay home from work and just express thanks for this crazy, crazy, crazy victory. Um, and this was the start of the Roman Empire. This was the pacification of Gaul. It meant that tremendous wealth was coming in. And, you know, it led to all the temptations. And by the way, Caesar's popularity, right? Um, this led to his political opponents back home saying he's too powerful. We're going to declare him a public enemy. And this led him to marching on Rome. So fascinating piece of history, the Battle of Elysia. Hopefully it made you say WT. It made me. I, I was very unfamiliar with the battle itself. What, what's where the what's where the um, the fortifications were? Is that still protected or is there like a suburb on it now? Well, so the fascinating thing is historians don't know exactly mm -hmm. where this town is. There there are towns in France that have the name like Elise, like something very close to it. And there's like three guesses where historians believe that the town is. But the mainstream one that that people assume for you know 200 years that was was the location of the battle people have pointed out that it does not match the contemporary descriptions like you know they said there's three hills and this one's holler and there's a river over here it doesn't really match it so people aren't really even sure where this battle took place wow that's a good story mike that definitely made me say wtf honestly that was yeah. good um you know, it's such a what I like about your story is that it gave color to Caesar, because I think a lot of what we know about Caesar are bullet points, but there's not a lot of color to him on battles like this. And, you know, the thought that went into, you know, well, I'll just build another fortification around me. Let's go, <laughs> baby. Right. I, you know, I, I like that. I mean, that's really good. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think a, another thing that it, made, it reminded me of is that a lot of people don't realize that most battles in what we consider, quote, ancient times, end quote, were sieges. They weren't really like guys lining up on the right and guys lining up on the left and they go, that was that happened. Yes, but it wasn't it wasn't as common as you would think. Most of the time they were sieges and you would just surround people and wait them out, and, you know, throw rocks over the wall or whatever. But right? <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's mostly how war was was handled at that time. That's so true. So true. Well, you mentioned Caesar's cape. <laughs> so you opened the door for me. I know it was an accident. So what I want to talk to you is about a little snail called the Murex. It was found in by the millions um, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean along the shores of what we knew, what we know now is Lebanon, northern Israel, southern Syria. But for a period of time there, um, there was a group of people first. Actually, originally, the Canaanites were there. And then after the Canaanites, they were kind of replaced, but still related to a group of people that we call the Phoenicians. Well, actually, the Greeks called them the Phoenicians. They never called themselves the Phoenicians. We'll get to why they called them the Phoenicians, though. They were called the Phoenicians. Um, they were never really an empire. They were they were a group of cities like Tyre and Sidon, Sidon and Byblos, and they acted together. They shared a culture. They shared a language. They shared a love of the maritime. Um, but but they weren't truly, as you would call, like like Rome was right. That That's not what they were or what later Carthage was. 
They were a group. They were not an empire of military. They were an empire of culture, commercial. Yeah, yeah. Right, of merit, uh -huh. like trade. The an empire of trade. Yeah, they shared a culture. They shared a language, but yet they didn't have like. I'm the king of the Phoenicians, right? So around 1500, 1600 BC, they started discovering that this Murex snail, if you poked it, it elicited a purple tint, right? A little purple color would come out of it. And people are like, oh, interesting. All right, I see you. And so they would take the, the Murex snails and they would like, you have to cut it out. And then you have to like, get, you have to hit this, you have to hit the shell but you can't hit it too hard or you'll smash it and you can't hit it light enough or it'll take you too long to get enough snails. <laughs> so they would, they over years and, you know, a century, they figured it out. Right? right. What happened after that was what we call the bronze age collapse. Now, yes. I think most people that love history, they think that the bronze age collapse is one of the most fascinating things in the world where you had all of these empires running at full speed and then boom, they were gone. If I remember the stats correctly on Bronze Age Collapse, and very few people talk about this, there were 25 advanced civilizations, 25 like really well-developed urban centers, and something like 23 of them in the archaeological record show burning by fire. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Or, like massive, like something happened, right? And they're not even sure what. They're not even sure why. So we blame it on, quote, the sea people. End quote. Sea people. Yeah, it's the sea people. I love that. We should have that now. Hey, what happened to my cookies? Sea people. <laughs> <laughs> sea people took it. Yeah. yeah, it was the sea people. Um, you know the pre-Greeks, they were all gone. You know it, it, the Cretes, Cretans. You know Crete was wiped out. Everything was wiped out, right? Um, except Phoenicia. And people are a little curious. People are like, "Hmm, interesting." Okay, Phoenicia's actually in the sea, but yet the sea people didn't do anything to the Phoenicia. Okay. Hmm. So there are kind of rumors amongst, you know, rogue historians that maybe the Phoenicians were in league, you know, with the Sea People. Um, it's a nice little. And by the way, I have heard a theory that the Sea Peoples, I mean, it is generally accepted that one tribe of the Sea People, they were called the Chardon or the Sardin, came from Sardinia. And Sardinia at this time experiences great wealth and connections with the Eastern Mediterranean. And going fascinating, because I never heard this angle of theory. Mm -hmm. This is the time when the Phoenicians and the Sardinians were great friends. And it's fascinating. So if this, if the Sardinians, the Sardin, the Sea People, that tribe, they're raiding Egypt, they're raiding Crete, but they're leaving Phoenicia alone. They left Phoenicia alone. That would be, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So, so here is Phoenicia after the Sea People, after the Bronze Age collapse. They're sitting there. They're in a great location, right? So behind them, they have Assyria or whatever is left of Assyria. Above them, they have whatever is left of the Hittites. Out there, they have, you know, what is going to become ancient Greece. Right. And then below them, they have the Egyptians. So they're in a great spot in this Mediterranean. So if they could just find the right product, they could really capitalize because they're, you know, they were left pretty much unscathed. They were kind of they were kind of la last man standing um, after the Bronze Age collapse. So they really stepped up their production of the Murex snails and they created what is known as Tyrian purple. Yes. And Tyrian purple. Super expensive, right? It takes 120 pounds of Murex snails to make one gram, wow. one gram of Tyrian purple. And that's a powder, wow. right? That creates the powder. And then you sell that and then you mix it with water and they can make it. And so I'm guessing, right? I'm guessing that this is why, the, you know, a synonym for royalty and wealth became the purple. That right? he is was ex born in the purple, right? I mean, that, right. it's because only, only royalty could afford to work. So purple. only royalty could afford this, especially after the Bronze Age collapse, while people were trying to get back on their feet, right? And kind of coincides with, you know, the founding of Rome as we know it, you know, during this period, it's starting to ramp up as a, as a, as a known a known player in the Mediterranean. Um, Greece, you know, is getting their sea legs about them. And so they have all these new markets. And so they're taking out this uh, Tyrian purple. And, and Mike, they're also taking out their alphabet because the Phoenicians created the alphabet that is most similar to the English alphabet and the Latin alphabet. And so while they were doing this mercantilism within the Mediterranean with their Tyrian purple, they're also spreading the idea of this specific alphabet that the Phoenicians had created. Um, That's right. And if I remember correctly, they spread it by trade to the Etruscans. The Etruscans then spread it by proximity to the Romans. The Romans spread it around the world. And this is why we use the Phoenician alphabet. That's right. Day. They also had huge forests of cedar trees behind them in those hills. The hills were covered with cedars. 
And so, so this is like the Cedars of Lebanon. That's right. right. I mean, uh, if you're watching this in Los Angeles, you know, there's a hospital here called Cedar Sinai. I'm always fascinated when you read, when you read, uh, you know, accounts from like the 1950s, it was called Cedars of Lebanon, which is, you know, a little more poetic. That's right. that's right. So they had cedars that they were selling, but the cedars, you know, that took, you know, that that's, takes up a lot of space. You know, one gram of this stuff. I mean, I guess you could think about it as cocaine. You know, it's like one little bit of it and you're you're making money. And so these guys were spreading uh, the Tyrian purple throughout the Mediterranean to the elites and the royalty so that you are correct, Mike. That is why purple became the royal color because it was so expensive. Remember, 120 pounds to make a single gram. Even today, um, that single gram of, of Murex snail Tyrian purple is worth three thousand dollars for a gram so that's today so you can imagine what it was then and you know that's how people identified back then they didn't have tv they didn't have radio it was like how they appeared right and so especially the elites so anyway so uh, while they were creating this mercantile empire around you know the way to look at phoenicia the phoenician let's just call it an empire ad arguendo right so we can have the discussion but if you if you ever if you ever had a uh, margarita which i know you've had many if you've ever had a margarita <laughs> and you know the salt around the rim yeah. that was like the phoenician empire like it didn't go very far it was just like right on the rim of uh, of the <laughs> mediterranean and so they created that's true yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point so they created all of these colonies right they they created a lot of colonies in spain in in southern france um, they had a, oh, oh, hold on. I got a WTF. I got a little history moment for you. A little, little history trivia for you. Okay. So if I told you that the suffix Lona means a city in, uh, the Carthaginian, uh, Spaniard, uh, a tongue. So what cities to this day still have Carthaginian names? Pamplona and Barcelona, right? Ah. And, and what if I told you that the most prominent Phoenician Carthaginian family their last name was Barca, right? Hannibal's last name was Barca. That's right. Barcelona, the city founded by Hannibal's family. And in southern Spain, Cartagena. That's right. That's right. Cartagena. That's right. Yeah. So those were all Phoenician waypoints, right? Where they had set up trading yep. colonies and they would like kind of like a Walmart, right? They had them all around the Mediterranean. <laughs> and so, but one of the, uh, one of their most successful colonies was on the coast, the northern coast of Africa in what is today Tunisia. And that was Carthage. So that was at first just a colony, just a waypoint for the ships. And but at a certain point later, Alexander the Great came through and he really did a number on Tyre. Um, and so they had to move. And by the way, they also began the Murex uh, agriculture up there, right in Tunisia uh, or Carthage. So they began to do it there, too. So um, all of the Phoenicians that were left in Tyre, they kind of came up and they went into Carthage and they began to create this great empire. Carthage grew so large and had such a fantastic maritime presence that at some point there was only room. I know you hear this in movies. There's only room for one of us. There really was only room for one of them, Carthage or Rome. And, That's so true. and between, I think, 250 to 125, is that around roughly uh, B.C.? Yep. We have a series of wars called the Punic Wars. wars. Yep. And that was when Rome and Carthage again only one could survive. That's how powerful Carthage was. It was a center of culture. It was a center of power. It was a center of, of mercantilism. And Rome wanted what they had, and they wanted what Rome had. One of my favorite historical um, moments is like, Cato the Elder. He, what he would say is like, at, at, at the end of every speech, he would be like, and that's why everybody should have free diapers. Carthage <laughs> must be destroyed. Like at the end <laughs> right. of everything. And that's why I'm opposed yep. to jaywalking. Carthage must be destroyed. <laughs> and, and when they did not listen to him, he went a step further. He sailed to Carthage. He sailed to Carthage. And, uh, you know, obviously this is before the era of refrigeration or pesticides or anything like that. He sails to Carthage and he picks fresh figs. And he sails back and he says, I want to let you know I picked these figs in Carthage. <laughs> and everyone's like, because his message was simple to anybody like the Romans who ate figs a lot is that they can sail here in two days, right? It's, yeah. it's short enough that Brilliant. a fig isn't going to spoil. Brilliant. It, right? Brilliant. It was a very tangible, you know, mm -hmm. 
reminder. Bro, he had an end for the Carthaginians. So, yes. I mean, you can imagine if politicians did that today. <laughs> and that's why I think clowns should be outlawed. Well, I mean, it must it, be destroyed. It, it, yeah, there, there was a, there was actually a joke about this, right? Is uh, is that Rudy Giuliani during his second term of mayor in uh, in New York, he had every sentence had a noun and a verb in 9-11. Right? It was like, <laughs> right. it's like, yeah, and I'm here for the grand opening of this elder. wonderful uh, factory. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this reminds me of my heroics at 9-11, right? It was very similar to that. Because of the mucus <clears throat> of a snail. <laughs> Found. That is a sentence that that, that <laughs> yeah. nobody ever. Right? That's going to be because my, of the mucus. That's going to be on my tombstone. Because of the <laughs> mucus of a snail found on the shore, right of Le today's Lebanon, we had one of the greatest empires in history and a series of the greatest wars in history, um, all because someone poked a snail and said, "Hey, that's purple," and there you so go. There's two there's two messages from today's episode, folks. The first one is use what you got, right? Mm. You have these people who noticed something about a snail. They made a desirable <laughs> product and they built a maritime empire on yeah. the backs of mucus of snail. And Caesar, you know, would not give in, you know, Gaul gave him trees. He used the trees and, uh, he did something amazing. Yep. So, uh, great episode, hopefully man. These both make you say WTF. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, if you guys like what you heard, subscribe, give us a like, give us a comment on where you think we messed up. Cause I know we messed up. Um, well, at least I did. Mike never messes up. Um, and thanks. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Hey, if you like what you hear, like, and subscribe, it really means a lot. And we would love to have you coming back every week. Thank you.